Uh, no, no audio. Oh, video? Video is fine, just you need to share. No audio. Yeah. You can do it from here. What I, I don't, the upper, I'm not on the idea. No, you can just. What? Well, I'm not on the audio. You want me to join audio or no? No, I mean, just you just disable the audio. Yeah, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, yeah, because you need to use this one. This microphone is for the remote user. Okay. And the local, we don't have speakers, so it's just a real voice. Thing. Okay. It's already turned on. Okay. Oh. Yeah, let's eliminate the right so that's it. I'm sharing. That looks better and better. Oh, yeah, I thought I could. I don't know how to make it go away completely. There's something to do. You know something. Oh, nice well, I'll just put it in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Go ahead. Society. He uh, uh, wrote uh, a uh, very famous book called Quantum Phase Transitions, which is really sort of survival for many of us who work on, on quantum phase transition issues. So the book has been cited more than 8,000 times by now. Uh, he has been elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He also has been elected a member of the American Advancements of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and uh, as a colorful aside, uh, he is the person who submitted the very, very first paper on the archive content matter section. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, 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 Therefore, it is a very, very special day to welcome you, Subir. Welcome to you, Subir. Okay. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to meet old friends and uh, talk to all of you today. So, uh, so I'm going to, I've changed the title a little bit, as you've seen, this was the original title, a little more specific of what I'll talk about. Uh, I'll introduce some uh, recent and not so recent work on what I call strange metals, which is a field of condensed matter physics. And then uh, remarkably, these have some connections with current research, even in uh, string theory and things of black holes. And I will say a little bit about the connection, uh, at least what I understand of it. Okay, uh, whoops. Okay, so let me begin by actually going all the way back to Boltzmann. Uh, and his, he had two key contributions would be essential to my discussion. Uh, okay. Hopefully I can make that disappear. All right, so uh, one of his first contributions was the statistical interpretation of entropy uh, in 1870. This was, of course, long before the invention of quantum mechanics. Uh, the idea of entropy came from the second law of thermodynamics as a pure uh, mechanical description in terms of heat flow in materials. 
Uh, and Boltzmann said, well, entropy is related to randomness. Uh, and roughly speaking, it's the log of the number of available states uh, of the microscopic ingredients. Um, so this was a big step because even the existence of molecules at that time in the gas in the air was not fully established. Uh, remarkably, this formula actually turns out to be quite easy to extend to corner mechanics, uh, where the, we relate what we call the density of states, the number of uh, energy eigenstate of some many body system and some <laughs> small energy interval. Uh, we take the logarithm of that and then call that the entropy uh, at that energy E. Uh, the other contribution of Boltzmann, which will play an important role, uh, is the Boltzmann equation, which goes back to 1872. And uh, this is, let's see, video. No. Uh, This usually means no, no, that, that's that's not going to help. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, I, there we go. Thank you. I couldn't see it with my without my glasses. Ah, perfect. So the Boltzmann equation was something uh, Boltzmann applied to a dilute classical gas, like the molecules in this room. Uh, and this looks like a, a bit of a mess, but it's really extremely simple. Uh, the left-hand side is just a restatement of Newton's laws of motion in the presence of some force that's acting on the molecule, some external force F. And Fp is basically the density of molecules with momentum P. So Boltzmann innovation was that you could still keep track of the distribution function of the molecule, even in the presence of collisions, provided the collisions were very rare. So he wrote down uh, in the right-hand sum, it was his real uh, new insight, which is the collision term, Boltzmann's collision term. Uh, and it's just proportional. So if two particles of momentum P and P1 collide, the collision term is proportional to FP times FP1. And the second term is the time reverse process. You just have to keep track of that uh, because the opposite process can also happen. And these delta functions just conserve energy and momentum. And this is some probability of our T matrix corner mechanically for the uh, for the collision to happen. Okay, so what his main assumption here was the assumption of what he called molecular chaos, that successive collisions are statistically independent. They happen so rarely uh, that you don't need to know whether this particle had collided with some other particle before, it's just already, uh, it's independent of that, that this the second collision will occur. Uh, and with that assumption, uh, and the fact that you get this product, uh, you can now proceed uh, and you have the equation. And this is an amazing equation. It, uh, you know, it describes the increase of entropy. It describes all kinds of non-equilibrium phenomena, uh, not only in a dilute gas, but even more dense gases, uh, the viscosity, everything. It's, the, it's really the foundation of uh, the theory of uh, dynamics uh, in, in classical gases. Uh, but even more remarkably, it's also the foundation for the theory in quantum gases. If you take a gas of electrons in a metal, you can pretty much apply the Boltzmann equation uh, unchanged. So now we have to introduce the idea of a quasi-particle uh, rather than the bare particle, because in a dense gas, each particle is not moving in empty space. It's moving in a fluid of the other particles. So, but you just imagine that just renormalizes the particle a bit. Uh, so FP is the distribution of the quasi-particles. Uh, so the left-hand side is essentially the same. The right-hand side is almost exactly the same, as you can see by comparing this equation and that equation. Uh, the only change are these one minus F factors here. And this is telling you, this is the exclusion principle. So you have to put in the fact that uh, if these two particles collide and go into these states, uh, then uh, these states better be empty. Otherwise, the collision is not allowed by the exclusion principle. So you add these one minus F factors and pretty much that's it. Uh, and now here, the collisions are rare, even in a dense gas, uh, because this right-hand side is actually very small. Uh, either this is zero or that's zero, except right near uh, you know, what we call the Fermi level, where you have both occupied and unoccupied states. Uh, but at typical energies, either all states are occupied or all states are empty. And so the collision just doesn't happen. Um, and so even though you have a very dense gas, uh, 
the idea of independent electrons, independent particles works, uh, and uh, the collisions are rare, and it can be treated as if they're statistically independent of each other. Okay, so solving this equation is basically the content of all of condensed matter physics before 1980. <laughs> Everything essentially reduces to this with a few bells and whistles. Uh, but the basic idea is already in Boltzmann's equation. All right, so let's apply this uh, to metals, Boltzmann equation, like the flow of electrons uh, in a metal like copper. Uh, so like I said, you can uh, think of these, the outermost electron in something like copper as flowing freely through the entire crystal and carrying current with rare collisions that are described by the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so if you solve the Boltzmann equation in a metal in reasonable conditions, uh, you'll conclude that the collision time or the time between these collision events uh, diverges at low temperatures uh, and diverges one over temperature squared. So it becomes, the theory becomes better and better the lower the temperature. Uh, and that's again, because of this quantum exclusion effect uh, of the Pauli principle. And one consequence of this is if you measure the resistivity of a metal, uh, that's proportional to the inverse of the collision time. And so the temperature dependent resistivity has a T squared dependence. Okay. And this is you know, very commonly seen. Uh, it works, you know, this application of Boltzmann equation uh, to many materials is pretty much the lifeblood of condensed matter physics. Uh, so now you can ask, you know, when is this going to fail? What is the, why is it really working? How short in particular can we make tau before the assumption of statistical independence of collisions uh, fails? And you can make kind of a quantum uncertainty argument that since the uncertainty of the energy, in a, uncertainty the energy of an electron is around kBT, uh, and then so the time should better be longer than uh, h bar over kt, otherwise you can't even define the energy of your quasi particle, which is colliding. So that led to the idea of what now people call the Planckian time, just the time that makes out, uh, only time that you can make out of fundamental constant of nature, which is h bar, uh, and temperature measured in units of energy. So as long as tau is bigger than h bar over kt, you would expect that the Boltzmann picture, Landau picture will work. Uh, the electrons are quasi electrons are well defined. Uh, and basically they move as if they're free along straight lines with a few rare collisions. Okay. Uh, so simple as those ideas are, they've been very, very successful. So now let me tell you about, of course, why I'm here. Uh, numerous experiments starting in the 80s, especially in these materials called the high temperature superconductors like yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, have a regime where this Boltzmann approach simply fails. Uh, and for want of a better word, it's been called the strange metal. Uh, this is above uh, the superconducting phase of these materials. I won't say anything about any of those. I'll just talk a little bit about some recent measurements uh, in the strange metal regime of this crystal. And there are many other measurements in many other materials. Um, so the, met, uh, the data I'm showing here is a very recent paper in Nature by uh, Louis Taifair and Brad Ramshaw and, and several other people. Um, again, I won't go into the details. They have a very clever method of measuring the scattering time by looking at the, uh, the flow of current in this material as a function of angle and the presence of a magnetic field pointing at different angles. And from that, they can deduce, uh, I just focus on this, what they call the isotropic component of the electron scattering time. That's the red line. So it's isotropic in angle as depending on the angle the current is flowing. And as a function of temperature, one over tau is a linear function of temperature. Uh, and in fact, the coefficient is pretty close to one. So here you're finding that uh, the collision time is right at the bound, you know, before below which uh, you can't talk about quasi particles. The collision time really has to be much longer than h bar over kt, uh, like I mentioned here. Right here, this is the Planckian limiting time, and it's practically equal to it. Okay. So just an interesting observation that I'm making at this point, and uh, and that uh, that you know this has been known for a while in uh, in many other materials, and uh, it plays a fundamental role in the ideas that I'm going to present. Uh, this importance of this time. These are some other measurements in another superconductor. Uh, this is on twisted bilayer graphene. 
they all show regimes where you have a resistance, which is a linear function of temperature, which is what again implies a scattering time, which is inverse of temperature rather than inverse of temperature squared. And even the coefficients are close to this Planckian limit uh, of order h bar over kBT. All right, so those are data, and I will say right away, there's no complete theory of that. This has been a long standing problem for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, I'll, if I have time towards the end, I'll tell you about our recent ideas, which we think are uh, going some way towards the theory. Um, so, but it's really needed. We need a theory for uh, the flow of electrons in what we call a strange metal, where the basic point is you cannot use Boltzmann ideas. You cannot think in terms of a gas of particles or quasi particles with rare collisions. Uh, it's much more of a collective phenomena. It's a collective quantum phenomena where you cannot neglect the, the correlations between successive collisions or in modern terminology, you cannot neglect the entanglement uh, of all the electrons. You really have to talk about transport and some kind of entangled soup of electrons. Uh, and why should such an entangled soup of electrons give you a collision time right near the bound? Okay, that's another open question. Uh, the big question, which I will not say anything is, and then how does this entangled soup of electrons as you lower the temperature uh, go superconducting as you can see in this picture at the record high temperatures? So this is, you know, it's the strange metal which is very naturally goes into the superconductor. So if you want to compute this number, you better know something about the strange metal. Okay, so, so that's a quick summary of a major open problem in condensed matter physics. Uh, and it, what it's clear, I think everyone agrees, it in, involves in a fundamental way going beyond the picture of Boltzmann and Landau and going beyond the idea of quasi particles, uh, which is so ingrained in us that, you know, if you pick up a typical paper, uh, they will use this idea without even mentioning they're using it. It's just implicit, but we have to go beyond that way of thinking of transport in a, in a material, in these materials. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to turn to another topic where there are also major unsolved problems, more of a theoretical nature because the practical consequences are, you know, are so far uh, not, not accessible but still very basic, much more basic problems really in combining uh, quantum mechanics with gravity. Uh, you would think this has nothing to do with the strange metal, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll agree there's something. Uh, so what is a black hole? Uh, so a black hole is a solution of Einstein's equation uh, where of a dense uh, piece of matter of mass M, if you squeeze it down to a radius smaller than the horizon radius, then the gravitational attraction of the mass is so large that light cannot escape uh, from inside the horizon to outside the horizon. So this was discovered first by Schwarzschild as a solution of Einstein's equations. Uh, but today there are many, many, many black holes known, including a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. Uh, just to get an idea of how dense the black hole must be, you have to squeeze the earth down to the radius of a P uh, to make a black hole out of the earth. But okay, so that's how matter dense matter is uh, in the center of our galaxy. All right, but physicists being physicists, they ask, but what about quantum gravity? Will that have any effect near a black hole? That's probably the region where it has the greatest effect because matter is so dense. So the basic structure of the basic ingredient in quantum mechanics is the idea of entanglement. Uh, and this is the famous EPR experiment. If you take an entangled pair of spin up and spin down electrons and separate them, uh, then they're still entangled. And if you measure one to be up, the other one will definitely be down and vice versa. But it's not until you measure them uh, that, you, that it collapses to a different state, no matter how far apart they are. But now imagine taking this famous EPR pair and doing the separation across the black hole horizon. Uh, so you are sitting outside, you have uh, this uh, qubit in your hand and you see it's down or it could be up. Uh, and, but that is entangled with some of the qubit inside the black hole. But since uh, whoever's measuring this qubit inside the black hole can never communicate to you, as far as you're concerned when you're sitting outside, uh, the universe just ends over here. Uh, so this is basically a random qubit in your hand, 
And randomness, Boltzmann told us, is entropy. So <laughs> that's a very crude argument, but not so wrong. Uh, that uh, a black hole, when, when you include quantum entanglement in a black hole, there's going to be some entropy and some temperature. So there were much, um, okay, uh, much cleaner arguments made by Hawking and Bekenstein uh, to show that black hole horizons have a temperature. Uh, and indeed, they gave a, an expression for it, a very precise expression for the entropy of a black hole of mass M. Uh, sorry, the temperature, the Hawking temperature, that's T sub H. Uh, uh, and then the entropy, the idea of the, uh, that was initially due to Bekenstein and Hawking gave the precise formula, including the coefficient for the entropy of the black hole. Here A is the uh, surface area of the black hole. So let me just give you a little background on how you would compute this, where these numbers come from. Uh, so they come from uh, kind of a semi-classical calculation um, in, uh, uh, in quantum gravity. So quantum gravity even today is not a very well-defined object, uh, but let's try to do it, uh, try to understand quantum gravity by the old method of Bohr and Summerfield, uh, where you do some semi-classical quantization uh, and you do a Feynman path integral uh, to do that semi-classical quantization uh, and you do it in imaginary time, okay? It's just much simpler to evaluate uh, these uh, path integrals in imaginary time. So if you take the metric of a black hole that was formed by Schwarzschild and put it in imaginary time, um, it has the shape of a cigar. So this is a, you're outside the black hole uh, and the circular direction is time. And the length of the time direction in imaginary time is just H bar over a temperature. And why is that? Well, that simply comes from the fact that, you know, the time evolution operator in quantum mechanics is e to the minus i h t over h bar, where h is a Hamiltonian. And the partition function of Boltzmann is trace of e to the minus h over kVt. So what's, if you now make time imaginary, uh, you, what time do you have to take to reproduce this? Well, the time you have to take uh, is exactly h bar over kVt. And it's periodic because of the trace operation. So the state, the initial state and the final state are the same. Uh, so what you have to do is evaluate the Feynman path integral on with, in this periodic geometry. Uh, and then if you look at the metric of Schwarzschild, you find that uh, it kind of shrinks down to nothing right at the horizon. Okay. I know that's very abstract, but this is what you end up doing. And if you just close your eyes and just try to do the Feynman path integral. So what you have to do then is to evaluate this integral. So Feynman told us to quantize a system, you first determine its action. So here's the act or the Lagrangian, that's LD, it's D space time dimension, D spatial dimensions, excuse me. It depends on the metric of space time, G mu nu. And I'm also going to allow for electromagnetic fields, so A mu. You make it periodic in time, like this circle. You integrate over all space. And you put a one over H bar, uh, so this is the action, this whole thing is the action divided by H bar, and then you integrate over all fields. That's the Feynman prescription. So this, we just write it down. We, we know everything here. This is the classical action of Einstein and Maxwell, and we just integrate over the whole mass in this geometry. This is what, you know, what we should do. That's the formula. Uh, the bad news is that this, this is completely ill-defined. Nobody knows how to make sense of it. It has all kinds of infinities that can't be cured by the usual tricks of renormalization. But nevertheless, uh, Gibbons and Hawking said, we don't care. We'll just take the saddle point. Look at the saddle point, the black hole saddle point, and then therefore get the entropy. And that's really essentially all they did. Uh, well, there's a few more issues with boundary conditions, which I'm not mentioning. But by evaluating the bohr summerfield saddle point of the of the path integral of quantum gravity, uh, they got these expressions for the entropy right here and the temperature. Okay, so that's what I, you know, and it's really in the end, once you accept that this is what you should do, it's not a complicated calculation. Uh, it just involves a little more, you know, just evaluating certain saddle points uh, in a curved space time geometry. But it's amazing that they got, you know, even today, I'm kind of amazed that this, this answer is correct. Uh, they have a lot of support for that. Uh, 
All right, so we've got this answer, let's believe it. And now we'll just stare at it and see what it means. Well, the first thing we find, uh, so this entropy formula in particular has some amazing features. Uh, one that it's finite. Uh, even that's quite amazing because if you just took pure electromagnetism by itself and tried to impute, compute the entropy of some region of space time, you'll run up with all kinds of infinities. Uh, but this seems to be finite. So somehow quantum gravity makes, gives a, some kind of discreteness to the number of degrees of freedom. But, and it's also not as large as you expect it. It's proportional to the area. So everything Boltzmann ever looked at, you know, the W of Boltzmann is always the exponential of the volume of the system. So here it seems like the number of degrees of freedom are not proportional to the area, they're proportional, not proportional to the volume, excuse me, but proportional to the area. So this leads to this uh, picture, I guess John Wheeler maybe drew it at some point, uh, where you're thinking of a black hole as being equivalent to, uh, or realizes a quantum simulation. If you wanted to realize a black hole in a quantum simulation, how many qubits would you need? Well, this says the number of qubits you're gonna need is proportional to the surface area of the black hole. Okay, so that's in some sense, the big question now we need to answer. How do these qubits interact to give you the feeling that you're in a black hole? <laughs> All right, and, but the number of qubits you're gonna need is proportional to the surface area. So that's the idea of holography. Um, wait a minute, did I mention that later? I, did I give somebody credit for holography? I, okay, I don't know. Forgot, uh, later on I'll give some credit. Uh, okay, so now I turn to another uh, interesting feature uh, of this black hole. You perturb the black hole by say you throw a little star in it or two black holes collide and then eventually they'll merge and relax back to, thermo to a perfect sphere. And you can ask how long does it take for that relaxation to happen? Uh, and that was computed a while back and you get this time eight by GM over C cubed. Okay, this was actually done before Hawking's calculation. But now all I do is I take this calculation of a black hole relaxation time and say, no, no, actually a black hole is not a classical system. It's a whole set of qubits at a certain temperature. And so let me use the parameters appropriate for this set of qubits. And what is the relaxation time in terms of the Hawking temperature? Well, amazingly, it is just the Planckian time. So, so there's a first connection between strange metals and black holes. If you think of them as quantum systems, this, they're in some sense the systems that relax to equilibrium as fast as possible, uh, roughly speaking, of in this Planckian time. And they will relax back to thermal equilibrium. Uh, and just for fun, I show you this uh, paper in PRL last year where they actually measured merger times of a uh, number of black holes as detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, and they found, you know, they can compute the Hawking the temperature from the mass of the black hole. Uh, and it again clusters around H bar over KT. <laughs> okay, so that's an introduction to basic problems in uh, black hole physics going back a long time. Uh, and as I've emphasized this Hawking's calculation was done in really very semi-classical sense uh, at the saddle point of this pad integral in imaginary time. Uh, and there are other ways of doing it, but they essentially reduced to that calculation. Uh, so the question you can ask is, is this a real entropy? Is this the entropy uh, of some real set of qubits which obey not the bohr sommerfeld theory, but the Schrodinger-Heisenberg theory we know is the correct theory, which has a discrete set of energy levels whose density must then be the same uh, as Hawking computed. Um, so there isn't, the answer is yes. And one answer came from string theory uh, a while back uh, where they, for certain supersymmetric solutions of string theory, uh, they were able to calculate the number of ground states. And the peculiar feature of this theory was that the, these, there were so many states, energy eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, which had exactly the same energy. In fact, there were exponentially large number of states, the number of such states were e to the s over kb, where s is in fact agrees beautifully with the, with the Hawking's result. So it's as if these qubits here uh, have essentially all states with zero, all the needed states with zero energy in string theory. 
so um, so that's you know that's remarkable progress but it's not the answer i claim uh to what you get from making sense of the semi-classical path integral if you actually had a black hole of this type but which didn't have supersymmetry it wouldn't have this this structure it wouldn't have all these highly degenerate states okay Oh yeah, this is where I put in holography. So can the black hole entropy be understood holographically? In other words, like a set of qubits. Uh, and that's a, a quantum system obeying Schrodinger's equation in one lower spatial dimensions. Uh, and many famous people have worked with this idea. And of course it's found an amazing realization in string theory. Uh, but we can, thinking more generally, if you're not going to use string theory and supersymmetry and all of that, uh, and want some simpler system to talk about these qubits, that system must be the, a system which has Planckian dynamics. That's what we've seen from the time evolution equations of black hole dynamics. They all obey, seem to obey this uh, relaxation time of h bar over kt. So you should find a qubit system which relaxes in h bar over kt. And what we learned from strange metal is that that must be a system that has cannot obey Boltzmann's equation. It does not have quasi-particles. Okay. Uh, so there's the connection uh, that we want to exploit. Um, this I won't talk about, but there's been a remarkable amount of progress on this question in the last few years, uh, where people have now understood not just the answers to the first three questions, but also answers to what happens to a black hole as it evaporates, uh, as it's radiating at a given temperature. Uh, okay, but I, you know, I won't say anything about that. Okay, so now let me talk about uh, the SYK model, which uh, you can see has a special place uh, <laughs> in, in my notebook. Uh, so what is it? Well, it's basically a solvable model of multi-particle entanglement in which we go beyond Boltzmann equation. I mean, Boltzmann equation is so successful, you want to go beyond it, but you want to go beyond it in a way where you don't lose control. Now, of course, I'd like to solve the strange metal Hamiltonian. I can't, nobody can do that. It's just too hard, even on a computer. Uh, but so you will look for a simpler model, which at least preserves uh, solvability, but also doesn't give you quasi particles in the end. Almost, you know, almost everything does, but this one amazingly does not. So you, you want to have enough interference, enough entanglement between the electrons so that you get a metal with no particle-like excitations. So, uh, so what is entanglement? So here I, uh, I go back to actually the original discovery of entanglement, which is by Kekulé, a chemist also working in the 1860s here, <clears throat> before the invention of quantum mechanics, uh, where you had this picture of benzene, uh, or this resonating valence bond picture, where the valence bond resonates between here and this configuration and that one. And that you can think of as the entanglement, the wave function of entanglement of six electrons, not an EPR pair of two, but kind of an EPR pair on the benzene ring of six. Okay, so this is how you would entangle six electrons. And Kekulé said, you know, he came to this idea of a daydream of a snake seizing on its own tail. So I thought, well, I definitely had a dream too. Uh, and it's based upon this Indian game of snakes and ladders where snakes are going every which way. Okay, so let me show you then uh, the SYK model. Uh, so you take a bunch of sites, which I've numbered here. Uh, these could be orbital labels in an atom or, or in some abstract labels of quantum states uh, that fermions can occupy. So the fermions or the, uh, or the electrons, if you wish, are the purple circles uh, and they're occupying some set of sites. So now there's some dynamics, these particles can move around. And the basic idea is they're only going to move in pairs. So for example, there's a move, the particles from site 11 and 12 will move to site 5 and 14. And in quantum mechanics, any such move is associated with a complex number. So to specify the de quantum dynamics of the system, I have to give you this complex number. Uh, okay, then there can be some other move uh, so they move, and then give you another move from 4, 5 to 11, 18. I have to give you another number. And then uh, this is another move, 14, 19 to 113, and so on. 
So I have to give you all of these numbers. They're on order n to the fourth numbers for n sites uh, because they're four indices. Uh, and I have to give you all of them. And all of these processes will happen in parallel. They will interfere with each other. If you want to really solve the problem, you got to take a huge Hamiltonian of size two to the n by two to the n and diagonalize it with these numbers all put in there. Uh, that's an impossible task. We can't do it for beyond 20 or 30 items even today. Uh, but it turns out you can solve this problem completely for all of its basic properties with one simple assumption. And the assumption is that these numbers are statistically independent. So we have n to the fourth, very large number of numbers. They have some definite fixed value. Uh, I just take some, I toss a coin and fix and pick all of them. Uh, and basically what you'll find is that the answer doesn't depend upon which numbers you pick. Usually, uh, almost always, except in very special cases of measure zero. Uh, and if, as long as you look at certain properties, some local properties, all of them will behave exactly the same way. So if they behave exactly the same way, you may as well average over them. And that's the key to the solution. Now, in fact, this is not such a new idea. Even Boltzmann did it. You just never mentioned it. Boltzmann did it by, when he was writing down the equation, he didn't tell you the initial conditions. You solve the Boltzmann equation by averaging over the set of all possible initial conditions. Uh, similarly here, I'm just averaging over, uh, it's quite similar, all these matrix elements in the Hamiltonian. Anyway, so with that averaging trick, uh, you can solve the problem essentially completely in the limit of large n. Okay, so if you want to, here's the actual Hamiltonian in second quantized notation, and these u alpha, beta, gamma, delta are, are independent random numbers, uh, and let's take them to have mean square value u. Okay, so what are the things you find after you solve this particular Hamiltonian in the large n limit? Uh, well, first of all, you find uh, exactly what you wanted, Planckian time dynamics. You find that uh, there is only one energy scale here, which is U, but if, as long as the temperature is much smaller than U, it doesn't appear in the time scale of which the system evolves. This is very different from anything you'd get from Boltzmann equation. From Boltzmann equation, you'd always get that the collision time is, has something to do with the collision cross section which depends on every little thing in the system. Here, there's kind of a universality. The thermalization time, relaxation time is independent of the couplings, provided this, the temperature is low enough. So that's, an, again, a very uh, important sign that you have no quasi particles here because you can never get this answer from Boltzmann's equation. Uh, okay, this was a surprise. Uh, this is something uh, we found that there's an extensive entropy as temperature goes to zero. But here, uh, sorry for a mathematical point, the order of limits is really crucial. You take the entropy of a system of size n, look at the entropy density, then you take the infinite volume limit, and you take the zero temperature limit. Uh, and this is not the same thing as having an extensively degenerate ground state. Uh, which is what you find in string theory and various, uh, and also certain artificial models like Pauling's ice model. So let's just do it. You put the system on a computer and look at all the states and compute the density of states. So this is what you get for, I think, 16 particles. Or these are all the 65,000 state, I think. Uh, and if you look at the density of states at low energy, they actually fit quite well to this formula that you get from a theory that I'll slowly mention. Uh, it's got this e to the square root of e dependence. Uh, and then if you, from the density of states, you can compute uh, the entropy as a function of temperature, and it has a linear dependence on temperature, which is very common in fermion systems. But also this constant here, S0, telling you that there's a ground, there's a zero temperature entropy. Okay, but now, so let's zoom in, where is the zero temperature entropy? If you look at the very low energy states, so we're zooming into these states down here, there you see a whole bunch of energy levels. They're all essentially unique. There's no degeneracy at all. They're in some random positions. Uh, and the reason you have a zero temperature entropy is not because of a degeneracy, it's because the spacing is exponentially small. 
And this immediately tell you again that the low energy excitation are not quasi particles. They're just not enough quasi particles to give you exponentially many levels. So instead you have some very chaotic system with each eigenstate totally different from the next eigenstate. In a quasi particle system, they'll be quite similar to each other. Uh, and they just happen to have this very small density of states, very small spacing and a very large density of states, excuse me. Okay, so that's the basic property of the SYK model. Uh, the, that particular energy and temperature dependence of its uh, entropy. So where did these results come from? Well, they come from evaluating the path integral, which in this case you can actually do. Um, so this is what I'm not going to describe here. Uh, and there's a bunch of references in the review article I refer you to to figure out where this came from. Let me just tell you what you find is if you want to determine the density of states, but you can then check this calculation with the numerics I just showed you, uh, that the low energy theory is associated with a time reprimization mode where tau goes to f of tau. Uh, it was uh, Alexei Kitev who pointed that out. Uh, and that's exciting because things are starting to look like gravity. Gravity is also a path integral over space-time reprimization. That's what the metric is, is a representation of the uh, space-time reprimization. Uh, so there seems to be at least something like a, a graviton emerging, but in zero space in one time dimension. Uh, there's also a phase mode having to do with the total density of particles. Okay. So this is the kind of path integral you get. Uh, we know exactly the whole form of this. And in fact, the whole integral can be done exactly. And those results agree beautifully uh, with these kind of numerics. So I think it's all in great shape. Okay, so that's, I've described the SYK model. And now I have 10 minutes or so. So now we're going to take the SYK model and solve, no, not quite, <laughs> answer the questions I posed in the first part of my talk. So first, uh, let me answer the question for a limited class of black holes called which are charged black holes, they have a net charge. All right, if you solve Einstein's equation for a charged black hole, really you have to solve Einstein and Maxwell's equation. Uh, you know, that's the theory of our universe. You solve it with certain boundary conditions that there's a lot of mass and a lot of charge uh, somewhere here. And you look at the space time along this direction. And what you find is something quite remarkable. Uh, out here, way far from the black hole horizon, uh, space time is uh, three plus one dimensional, like we know it is. But as you get closer and closer to the black hole horizon, there's a factorization, there's a dimensional reduction. The space time has a two dimensional component, which is called ADS2. Uh, so it has a you know, very nice, it's a uniformly curved space with negative curvature. And the S2, well, that's just the sphere. So what does this picture mean? The picture means that if you're coming down in this direction uh, and you want, you're solving Schrodinger's equation as you're falling into the black hole, uh, this tells you that you can just ignore the angular direction and just solve Schrodinger's equation uh, in one plus one dimension, which is a lot easier than solving Schrodinger's equation in three plus one dimension. So in the end, this black hole in our universe close enough you go close enough to it, looks like a black hole in a space time of one plus one dimensions. All right, so that's very exciting because holography told us if you want to represent any black hole by a qubit, you have to reduce the dimension by one. So that means it should be a quantum system. It better have Planckian time dynamics, which is zero space and one time dimension. Well, we know what that system is, and that's the SYK model. This is the exact. So it turns out if you take this theory of starting from Einstein Maxwell theory, and you write down the path integral uh, in one space with the, the red radial direction zeta and time tau, you'll get some Lagrangian here. But this is what you would get starting from Einstein's equations. And that path integral turns out to be exactly equivalent to the path integral you would get starting from the SYK model. It's exactly the same. <laughs> uh, and the more careful connection is that the metric here becomes a time reprimization. And the metric is still in one plus one dimensions, but you may know that gravity in one space and one time is kind of simple. It has no gravitons. So the only part of the metric that matters uh, is the boundary. And so F of tau is basically some 
representation of the fluctuation, the boundary between one plus one dimensional space time and three plus one dimensional space time. Okay, so, so, so that's a quite a remarkable result. It allows therefore to go, at least in the simple case at low temperatures near a charged black hole. It allows us to completely, to complete the program um, of Gibbons and Hawking. We can just do the exact pan integral. We don't have to just take the saddle point, do the whole thing. Uh, and we have an example of a completely unitary quantum system, which is the Hamiltonian I showed you, or the SYK model, which whose low energy limit also is described by the same theory. I'm not saying that the charged black hole actually has an SYK model. No, I'm not saying it probably need to get the all energy scales. You have to do string theory, uh, probably. But if you are just interested in the low temperature limit, and I want to understand some statistical properties of the states at low temperatures and energies, then the SYK model is adequate. Uh, in fact, you can, for example, uh, you can compute the correction to this entropy. This was the entropy that was obtained by Hawking uh, and Gibbons, and this is the correction as temperature. And it's the first quantum correction, and it's common to both the SYK model and a generic charged black hole in, in our universe. Uh, so, and you can also then compute the density of states. And in fact, this is the answer for the density, low energy density of states of a uh, generic charged black hole. Uh, you know, it's this constant term and then e to the cinch of square root of e, uh, which agrees, which is in fact the coarse grain density of states uh, of the SYK model. Of course, it won't get all these, uh, these random things. Those features depend on every little detail of your model. But if you don't care about those very fine grained features, it's the generic answer. And we expect the same is also true for charged black holes. Uh, they have this density of states, which is very different from the kind of answer you get from string theory for, very, for a black hole with the same kind of near horizon structure. All right, uh, I think I'm out of time. So finally, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's been, I think, a, a reasonable success by contribution of many people uh, making progress beyond the Gibbons Hawking calculation of black hole entropy. So, um, but we are still stuck with the problem that originally motivated me, <laughs> linear T problem. That I don't think we are not as close to a solution yet, but, you know, I think our latest paper is uh, maybe, okay, so I'll just tell you a little bit about our latest paper. So what we do is we take actually start from the microscopic model uh, of the superconductors, which is a metal with a, with a Fermi surface with these states occupied and those states unoccupied in momentum space. And we couple it to some boson, which is critical, meaning it has zero, lots of zero energy excitations. It could be some pneumatic order parameter or ferromagnetic order parameter or some gauge field. Anyway, you couple this boson to this Fermi surface. So you can couple it by some kind of Yukawa coupling. All right, uh, the, literally the number of papers written on this problem is infinite. <laughs> it's in the, definitely in the large end limit. Uh, but this is also not a problem that's been solved. There's now starting to be some numerical work. And I think a lot is understood, but there is even today, no systematic method of solving it. No control way of saying, what are the corrections to what you've computed? So we came up with an idea that gives us at least a control. And the idea is drawn from the SYK model. We say, well, uh, put some indices, IJL, put some coupling, GIJL, and make this coupling random. <laughs> and suddenly the thing becomes much under control. Now you might say making it random, you made like this is a different model. Well, we don't think so because we expect all the couplings to flow to the same fixed point at low energies. So similar to the SYK model with the specific value of the coupling didn't matter we're conjecturing that it doesn't matter here either. But this theory, however, still has zero resistance. And then we realized that and this is our recent paper just put on the archive a month ago, where we put in a second coupling where there's spatial randomness in the interaction. This is physically different. You have some spatial randomness and that turns out to lead to actually reproduce many of the observed properties. But let's see what the referees say, <laughs> okay. All right, to summarize then, uh, so the SYK model, uh, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, it has the essentially unique property of being a solvable model. 
in a regime where there are no quasi products. You know, all of Bethe ansatz, all the other solvable models you find in, in many body physics are essentially integrable and uh, they do have a quasi particle description and they don't have uh, relaxation in the Planckian time. So it's just not present in anything else uh, of this simplicity <laughs> or anything else, as far as I know. Uh, and then amazingly, when you take this model, which is solvable with the Planckian time dynamics, it seems to have connections to gravity, but in one plus one space time dimensions. Uh, and that connection has helped pro understand something about the corrections to the Gibbons Hawking calculation. And it also played a role in this wor recent work uh, in evaporating black holes, none of it by me, uh, which is, I think, also a very exciting development. And uh, I just told you about some recent work with my very bad, uh, very bright colleagues, uh, Avishka Patel, who's a postdoc at Berkeley, and How You Go, who's a you know, graduate student at Harvard, and uh, Ilya Estlitz, who's also a postdoc at Harvard. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, QCD in two dimensions, I would say that QCD in three is a little more sensitive to the microscopic detail, but I'm talking about QCD uh, in the strange, in the quark blown plasma. If you want to understand the quark blown plasma, I think to some extent that's true. Not elsewhere. If you want to understand the proton spectrum or some baryon region, forget, no, of course not. That's the confining region. You have to in the regime where there's no quasi particles. The baryons are quasi particles. Uh, in the quark gluon plasma, where there's also the connection to the ADS CFT corresponding, that's a regime where we expect and quite a lot of independence of the microscopic coupling, they just drop out, uh, as in the strange metal problem. Yes, so that's, that's the point. Uh, and, you know, in fact, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, the measurements and Rick somehow seem to fit supersymmetric uh, Yang Mills theory not so bad. Uh, and I think that may be the reason behind it. But if you really want to go beyond supersymmetric Yang Mills, I think the way to do it is by putting in random couplings. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, took the potentially states or the degeneracy of the states to the number of greater than one. That's why well, maybe two or three, but it's not e to the or ten to the twenty-three. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> what was the argument uh, exactly? Like, could you tell us a little bit more about this point of particles creating potentially states? Ah, oh, that argument. Okay, sure. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't present it, and uh, I sometimes present it in a talk, but I had to shrink this talk. Uh, so, well, so suppose I start with three particles, okay, on n sites. So I have three particles on n sites, n sites, and I have three particles. Then I have so a bunch of single particle states. So then if you look at the energy, let me call it little e, you'll get a bunch of states, and these are the three particle states, single particle states. To determine these states, all you have to do is uh, determine uh, n by n matrix, which is trivial. Okay, and the spacing between these levels uh, is one over n. Okay, now let's take the many-body point of view. So these are the states epsilon. The many-body energy is the sum of alpha of all the occupied states. So n alpha is either zero or one, depending on whether the state is occupied or not. And these are the e alpha. So what is the ground state? Well, the ground state is these states occupied. Suppose you have this many particles, okay. So that's your, in your many body space, there's your ground state. What is your first excited state? Well, you can add a particle here or remove a particle there. Okay, so you'll get some other states here. What is the spacing between these states? It's one over n. So in the many body space, when you have quasi particles, the spacing at the bottom is one over n. And that's why the entropy vanishes because there's not enough states to get a finite entropy, entropy density. However, in the SYK model, it is extremely different. There's many, many more states. Uh, so here, down here, here the spacing is e to the minus n. Uh, that's why you have an entropy. 
at zero temperature. So just the fact that the spacing is e to the minus n tells you you don't have quasi particles. <laughs> and, and another thing is that you know this state, it's some complicated state with all these states occupied. The next state is only slightly different. You just change a few particles here, everything else remains the same. So these states are very similar to each other. If you look at these states, they have no relation to each other. <laughs> and so it's very chaotic. And that's really fundamentally the reason you can average over things. Because just since you don't have quasi particles, things are very chaotic, you may as well average. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in principle, yes. I mean, if you could build a quantum computer with uh, these kind of uh, gates, uh, with all of these gates, yes, there's no limit. But and people have some ideas on how to build this kind of gates on a quantum computer. Yes. So then, yeah, uh, there are people thinking about such things, but I, I, so far, I don't know of any workable. These are quite non-local gates, and the limitation of current architecture is that you have relatively local interactions. Yeah, uh, but we'll see. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I've waited thirty years, so I can wait. Well, I don't know how much longer, but. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You, so people have certainly put what you don't want to do is a single hopping, then you'll get quasi products. But you put four, six, eight, that's all been done, and they're very similar to each other, except the two case, which is which is free electrons, essentially. Uh, but once you have four, is the simplest case where you get quasi, no quasi products. And that's the case we was. That's also more physically reasonable. Uh, but there's a whole family of such models where, which have basically the same properties. I mean, one thing that will change when you have four rather than six, uh, this number would change 0. 0.464848 would be slightly different. <laughs> but it's known exactly what it would be. <laughs> uh, you showed that uh, uh, starting with the uh, SYK model, you can uh, derive corrections to the well-established black hole uh, mm -hmm. formula. So uh, there is a flow of thought from starting from quantum method towards the black hole. Is there something that you learned from the black holes which you can bring back and explain the high temperature supermassive? High temperature. Well, no, but it's certainly a measurable quantum method. Uh, I mean, so you know, for example, this this result here that the density of states here has the square root of e and this form. This was not known until people from quantum gravity got involved, like people mentioned down here, uh, and started solving this model. And they applied method of string theory and things they've learned there to this problem for just the SYK Hamilton. So for, as just a, someone, if you're just interested in condensed matter and say, I don't care about quantum gravity. Well, if you care of the SYK model and you want to understand the density of states, you're forced to use quantum gravity. And I didn't know enough about it to do that. So didn't do it a long time ago. So it's really wonderful that that can be done. So, so there's been certainly back and forth. And, and also, you know, these results, I told you about the corrections. Uh, for example, this dense density of states, this is a correction to the Hawking result. There's no reason in principle, looking back, that Hawking couldn't have done it. I mean, there's not that much more than what he was already doing. It's just uh, one more path and that he had to do. Presumably, he didn't bother to do it because he didn't think it would make any sense. So, and I think what the SYK model gave the quantum gravity people was a direction which to look, some confidence that there's an answer here that could make sense. Once you have that idea, then you can do this integral. I mean, I, I could teach it in a graduate class uh, well, after a couple of other lectures, but okay. <laughs> uh, but you're saying about high temperature superconductor. Well, like I said, I think. Uh, at this point, we, I, I don't believe that this, this particular model is anywhere close to the microscopic physics uh, of the high TC materials. I mean, it's just a model without quasi products. There's no square lattice here, there's no spins, there's a lot of other physics that goes in. 
Uh, and to get close to the high TC, I think we have to, uh, well, our best guess at this point is to use this random coupling model, and which also was inspired by SYK thickness, this, this model right here at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, so this particular model does not have a large entropy. It has a it has a T log T entropy actually agree which agrees with the experiments also. Uh, so you don't need it to get a non quadratic particle. No, no, in zero dimension you need it, but not in higher dimensions. Once you have one higher spatial, so the zero, the SYK model is a zero dimensional theory, quantum theory. It's equivalent to gravity in two uh, well zero plus one dimension. It's like a one, it has one space time dimension. And gravity has two space-time dimensions, but now we, you know, the and gravity in two space-time dimensions happens to be the right physics for a charged black hole for subtle reasons. And there are no charged black holes in the universe. I mean, they're almost certainly all neutral. <laughs> so to, to solve the real problem, you have to do neutral black holes, and you have to do quasi-particles in higher dimensions. Those are still largely unsolved problems or non quasi particle metals in higher dimensions. <laughs> well, we're making some progress, but yeah. Yeah, so what is it about the charged black hole uh, that reduces the dimension? It's just, okay, I, I wish I had a better explanation. Maybe there are people in the audience who can explain this better than I can. If you just solve Einstein's equations uh, in, in the, with the boundary condition that there's a net charge here, so there's a Gauss's law tells you there's an electric field going out. Uh, and they basically tell you that the metric factorizes into this ADS2 cross S2. I don't know, maybe there's experts here who can say more. Uh, yeah, Veronica, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it needs to be an extremely charged black hole, as much charge as you can put in, such that the object still remains a black hole. You could have a Black holes of zero temperature in Earth's nature, which are not charged, but are maximally rotating. Yeah, that also would work. That also has a, it, it supplies factor ADS2 plus S2, but it does have a right. uh, similar type of geometry. So the point that Veronica is making has to have a lot of charge. That's the same as me saying it has a temperature that's very low. Those are the same thing. Uh, so at very low temperatures, or what's sometimes called the extremal limit, uh, then you have this factorization. But even in string theory, those are the black holes we solve. Okay, so now we can do it without supersymmetry. Uh, it's a start, and and amazingly, when you take these type of black holes and and look, you know, Hawking famously said that, you know, unitarity is lost in black hole evaporation. Well, I think now there's very convincing argument that at least for these black holes, it's not. You can see a black hole evaporate and see how the entanglement entropy is, uh, you know. Yeah, but that's a whole different talk, which I, I don't know very little about. Yeah. <laughs> Let's thank Subir for this exceptional talk. This was I understood bits and pieces before, but now you really put them into an art. So that was Thank you. Thank you. Part of my question was that uh, uh, um, that uh, so are there something what we can learn? So. Uh, you, you said that what we learned from the black hole community yeah. uh, for the purpose of the SYK is, for example, the density of state. Yeah. And uh, does this lead to a, a uh, something which is measurable 